our scripture this morning in First Kings in the 18th chapter. Very familiar, very familiar passages of scripture that I was praying, really praying last night and seek, trying to seek the Lord. And I had two thoughts just come on me, just very vividly on the occasion. And it's a, taken from the 18th chapter, First Kings, and the 21st verse, and it says. And we're going to read some more scripture here, but the, the text would be, the thought, I think, this morning would be, why halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him, but if thou, then follow him. In other words, if the Lord be God, follow him. Well, let's read a little bit here. We're going to read, breaking in that 17th verse, 1 Kings 18th chapter, breaking in there. 1 Kings and the 18th. 18th chapter, 1 Kings. Okay? 1 Kings 18, breaking in here to 17th verse. And the Bible says, And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubled Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent all unto all the children of Israel and gathered his prophets together unto Mount Carmel. <coughs> Elijah came to all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. <clears throat> if thou, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. And we're going to stop there. Father, we thank you this morning. This privilege we have. This morning we are congregated together before the throne this morning. And Lord, we pray that you'd give us what you'd have us this morning to receive in our hearts. Hear with our ears, receive with our hearts. And Lord, if they be just one that needs to rejuvenate that spirit within them, renew that Holy Spirit within them, that there be one Father that's on death row this morning that needs pardon. <coughs> well, we pray for the salvation of the lost. We pray for the reclamation of the backslider and the sanctification of the believer, holy to thy will as we live in these perilous times spoken of in the Word. Help us this morning, Father. We know that now is accepted time. The day is the day of salvation. We love you. We praise you. We'll give you praise for all that we've accomplished in this service now. In the name of Jesus. And amen. amen. That 18th chapter, it's a very familiar story that we're all familiar with, no doubt about it. But we had a confrontation here in the Bible, good against evil. Evil against good. And, if, and I, would, <laughs> I, would, I would have to declare this morning we're living sort of in the same time today. It's amazing how history sort of comes as a circle. Those that study history know often time that history will repeat itself. I've always been an advocate of history. I love to read history because we should learn something from it. Now, we got a generation today that's just trying to do away with all the history they can. Amen. I mean, they're taking down flags. They're taking down monuments. They're taking some uh, symbols, even biblical symbols, and they're trying to pervert it. They did all sorts of atrocities that has taken place today to try to pervert, corrupt, and desensitize the Word of God in moral living. Think about that for a minute. I mean, the, the world has lost its moral compass. It really has. Prophet Isaiah in the 5th chapter and the 20th verse, we quote quite often time. He said that day would come, they would handle sin as if it were a cart road. They call good evil and evil good. That's just what the devil would do. He'd come and pervert things and make you, in other words, in the wise men in Proverbs said they would justify the wicked and condemn the just. That's the day we live it in. You try to do right. You're living by God's bold precept and by his word. More than likely you're going to catch persecution and criticism because of oh now 
That was way back then. We're in a different generation now. Yeah, we're in an end time generation. Amen. They have lost their fear of God. They have lost Amen. their reverence for the things that are holy. That's the generation we're dealing with now. We read all about it in the scripture. Jesus foretold in the 21st chapter of Matthew's gospel. He said the love of many shall wax cold in that end time. He's not speaking about just the love of many shall wax cold. Love of God. Love for the word of God. Love for fellow man one for another. Imagine just heartless that would kill their own unborn. It's taken place. It's been taking place for a long time. I can't imagine the blood that would cry out from the grave. Not just Cain's, Cain and Abel, not just the blood of Abel, the, the blood that cries out from the land that's been murdered and just love of many. Even the animal kingdom has more compassion than that. Amen. If you don't believe it, just get, just go up to a new uh, brood of chicks and go try to pick one of them up with the old mother hen around. Find out what happened. Amen. Well, just about any any creature of the animal kingdom. I mean, they'll defend their little one, but man that's supposed to be more intelligent and have more of a, a moral capacity that would murder the children? Why? For the sake of convenience. Because they're living immoral. And so for the sake of convenience, well, I wanted a girl and I got a boy. I wanted a boy and I got... You just... Uh, unbelievable. The satanic, demonic influence that has saturated not just America but the world the, the, the lands of the world they've lost their moral compass Elijah was a man of God he was a prophet he was a preacher a prophet of God he was one of God's mighty prophets so so much so when, when John the Baptist came back they thought maybe it was Elijah had come back if you read over in the gospel because he was bold he was brazen I don't believe he compromised even one bit amen he was very brazen. And then, he, so, Ahab here, the king, I mean, it, it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, and Eli Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? They're accusing the pastors of the land and Christians that walk uprightly of being the problem and the trouble. Under a certain administration we had not so long ago, they said if you were a, a Bible Christian, you were vocal about it, you could end up on a homeland terrorist list. Become a homeland terrorist. Why? Trying to get somebody saved? Tell them what they're doing is wrong and it's sinful? And if they don't repent of it, become born again of the Spirit of God, they're going to burn in hell? That's pretty radical, isn't it? Well, is it radical enough? Go out by a man's house. It was on fire, caught up in the flames. Well, we better not bother them. They might be asleep. Really? Is it that radical? Sure it is. People live in any old way. We've, we've, be, we've become a very soft, lax time, a generation. I have friends that's in the military now. I just can't hardly believe it. I got two grandsons serving in the Army. I said, that ain't the same ar Army I served in back in the 1970s. I can promise you that. They come in dry. <laughs> got some veterans sitting here. You know what I'm talking about. Come in 4 o'clock in the morning. You're on the top bunk. Grab you by the hill and drag you up. It didn't matter if you broke your broke your arm or your rib cage, they just send you over to the man and get you fixed up, I reckon. They were using a lot of vocabulary that you don't find in Webster's Dictionary. No. <laughs> well, that's just how it was. And uh, they didn't care about hurting your feelings. Matter of fact, I think they've done everything within their power to try to hurt your feelings. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure of that. Why? Because they want they wanted to, you to become obedient to orders. Well, we're not in the military. We're not in the Marines or the old army. I understand all that, but God does have a moral precept, and the Word of God is the moral is the Word of God. Amen. They tell me now. My grandson's telling me that if the drill sergeant offended you, you just fill out this little card. I forget what they call it. The stress card. Stress. Thank you. A stress card. Can you imagine that? A stress card. <laughs> We didn't even have that in public school. Amen. I love to sign a stress card when she's washing my mouth out with a ball of ivory soap or pine tar. Amen. Come on. We didn't have the option of a stress card. Well, praise God. Somebody else been there beside me. I know good well you have. Amen. You just admit to it. Got her mouth washed out. 
They all had signature paddles, some drilled holes in them, some put notches along the side, you know. We talked about that out on the playground, you know. I said, well, you know, so-and-so, don't get whipped by him. He put notches on the end of his paddle. That thing really stinks. But that one over there had holes on there. I, th I just see them all sitting around the coffee table trying to figure out what they're going to do next. <laughs> we raised three of our grandchildren for three years. I can't help it. We're still old school. We was then, too. And because we, they were our grandchildren, of course, you know, the children's Gestapo. I don't know what they really call them. We call them Gestapo. But they come out to visit, make sure that we weren't abusing them and... Well, I'd already made this beautiful paddle. Matter of fact, my daughter has it now. I give it to her. But beautiful paddle about that long and made it look real nice with polyurethane. I wrote Proverbs on there, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child. I mean, you know, we covered ourselves really well. But I had it hanging up where it was visible. So they come out and sit around the table. Do you whip these children? I said, you better believe it. Amen. <laughs> if they need it, if they married it, they're going to get it. Well, fortunately, we got the right ones, I guess. They was all right with it, as long as we didn't hurt them too bad. <laughs> well, praise God for all that. A lawless generation. They had become lawless and lost their fear of God during this time. Imagine that, a, a nation of Israel that had not been eyewitness account to the miraculous things that God did in their deliverance from Egyptian bondage. Amen. All that God brought them through. It, it's hard for me to conceive sometimes how somebody could have lived the life of a drug addict or a drunkard or whatever else they were, bank robber or whatever, and they come and get deliverance at an altar of prayer and God delivers them and takes all that want to out to do the things that was contrary to the will of God and puts a want to to come to church to receive the blessings of the Lord and to learn about the Lord. Because see, the Lord does change all that. I was criticized here recently. So my, I quoted the scripture there in Hebrews 10. There it talks about if we sin willfully, willfully, after we've received the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. He said, now, he said, preacher, now you know that everybody just sins all the time, all the time. I, I asked a question. I said, do you go out and visit the cat house or do you go to the bar and get stone drunk? Are you smoking a, joint, a marijuana joint right now? Well, no, of course not. This was the pastor I was talking to, by the way. He said, of course I don't do those things. And I said, then did not the Lord change your heart and your want to's? Amen. That's right. Well, praise God. Amen. It's, it's, if any man be in Christ, old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Yeah. The old timer said they changed their hitching post. <laughs> They're not going to the same place they had frequently <laughs> been going to. Now they're going to church. Why? So they can hear the word of God. Romans in the 10th chapter says, How shall they hear? Except the Lord sent a preacher want them to hear. Amen. So they come to church to hear the preaching and the word. Why? Because they have a want to. Right. I like what one preacher said one time. I think it's one of the best explanations I've ever heard. He said, You get a real good dose of salvation, born again, love Jesus, love the things of God. He said, He said, It will not make you quit snowing in your sleep, but you will wake up in good humor. I kind of like that. <laughs> Unfortunately, when the Lord cleans up the heart, it don't perfect our mind in judgment. Now, in the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, we know that, that they even offered sacrifice for the sins of ignorance. That's cutting it pretty close right there. But it's not willful, premeditated, malicious, no fear of God, sin. Do we all get that? In the Roman letter in the 6th chapter in the 1st verse, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. What's he say? God forbid. God forbid. Yeah. Does that kind of go along with Hebrew letter in the tenth? If we willfully? <laughs> he only died. He, he went to Calvary one time. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now we do have an advocate with the Father. That's one thing I love about the Baptist because we have an advocate. Because in other words, you got some churches out there, well, if you backslide, if you do this or you do that, the devil's going to come and backslide you, and that's it. You just might as well throw the towel in and quit. No, that's not what we do. If we mess up, we're going to repent and take a spiritual whooping, and we're going to advance toward the kingdom. We're going to do a little better next time around. Amen. Why? Because Amen. we just learned a lesson, didn't we? Amen. Well, praise God. We just learned a lesson. We haven't made it to heaven yet, but we're on the journey. 
One old preacher said something like this. He said, the morning of life is gone, but we are journeying to that land. It's up to you to make the destination, by the way. Hopefully you've looked at the road map and looked at your navigational tools. Amen. And you figured out the right route to where you need to end up at. Right. Well, praise God. Yes. But they, you know, there's some folks that, that will choose a little two-lane highway. Now, the Bible talks about the broad way and the narrow way. Now, I would, I would personally would rather be on a two-lane highway that's straight and narrow without potholes and all that. But I'm fortunate along the devil's around. There's going to be a few potholes and maybe an obstruction here and there. that we just have to navigate and get through it. Well, praise God. Is that what we got to do? We got to navigate through that mess, don't we? Amen. And if we if we mess up along the way and get off the wrong road, we made a wrong turn someplace, we're going to ask the Lord to forgive us according to 1 John 1, 9. Huh? We have an advocate with the Father, yes. the righteous. Praise the Lord. Let's go on here. I'm getting away from Elijah. Elijah had a confrontation here, not with not just with the king alone, but they came to a challenge and answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house. Sound like another prophet that I knew, named Nathan. Remember that? He went before David. He told about this story. He said, David, thou art the man. You're the one. You're the one that's guilty. I said, we could preach on David this morning. I, but we go on here. In that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Then you got people come up with this foolish nonsense and apparently don't study American history. Well, now, America, uh, Islam had a lot to do with the foundation of America. Where, where do you find that at in the history of America? It was those Puritans that come over here seeking freedom so they could serve the true and the living God in freedom. Amen. Amen. In, re in liberty, they call it religious liberty back in those days. Amen. I'm, I'm very careful about using the word religious nowadays because that applies to a whole lot of things. There's a lot of folks doing a lot of things under religion, but it's not relations. That's the problem. There's a difference between religion and relation. There's a lot of religion going on. Relation's what I'm interested in. Something that's help, heartfelt. Something that we know. When the Lord speaks to us, and we can feel and sense the presence of the Lord. Anything less than that, you're all missing the mark. You might feel good with a New Year's resolution. Uh, uh, resolution. You might feel good over this or that or the other thing. But listen, you're not going to really feel good until you get born again and you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit of God down in that heart of yours. Amen. 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 Follow Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450. Baal worship was predominant during that time. It actually come from the Greek word belos. He's also, uh, some actually refer to him as the Greek god Zeus. Now if you've ever watched any TV movies on some of that nonsense, you, some people are familiar with what they call Zeus. Or maybe I'm not saying it right. That's Zeus, Zeus? I believe that's right. It came from Balos. And it was predominant. We got religions today that are very predominant. We got Psalm 1 today. I believe it's described very, very discreetly over in the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse. And there it talks about the, that one that sits on the seven hills of Rome. It talks about the callers of the church. And uh, they pray to somebody besides the Lord. Mary worship. And they pray to idols. I remember one place we worked one time. This guy was carrying his old statues around in his hip pocket. I said, Lord, mercy, for the sake of me, what, what is with that? Oh, these are saints. Saints? Really? He had these little statues he called saints. I said, really? I said, what do you do with that? He said, well, I pray to it. I said, you pray to it? You pray to that little thing? I said, seems pretty disrespectful carrying around in your hip pocket. That's what he's going to pray to that thing. And uh, he carried that around. And I had another fellow one time. His, his wife was out of South Louisiana. She was a full-blooded Cajun. And her mama had, he, well, first of all, I'm getting ahead of myself. I probably have shared this with some, but he got a good friend of mine. We taught him to dive underwater one time and come out in diving. And, and, I, and he knew we were a preacher. And he, he said, you know, he said, do you perform exorcisms? I said, exorcisms. I, I said, you mean c commanding demons out and casting devils out somebody? Yeah, exorcisms. 
Well, I said, well, I, I said, we're not looking for no devils, but we're not, we're not out looking for them. But if we happen to get, you know, if we happen to have to contend with one, and the Bible says we have all power over the enemy. Amen. So we'll deal with it. He said, well, could you come to my house? He said, my house is, I got problems. I said, what problem's that? They got this parrot, this red-headed parrot from uh, Africa. I forget what to call it. It had a, something to do with the red head, but I don't recall the name of it. But big, pretty parrot, about that tall, with a big, bright red head, a head and green lime, green collar, pretty thing, red tips on its wings. He said, that thing talks intelligible conversation. I said, oh, no, they don't. They just rehearse what they hear. They're not talking intelligible. Well, no, this one does. I said, then it's not the bird. It must be a devil or something. My wife called it the devil bird. <laughs> well, I guess one of the girls got in trouble at school, and, and uh, he had to go get her from school. They suspended her for about a week, and they had, when they came back in the door, he said, when they came in the door, that parrot started calling his daughter names, started calling her horrible names. And, and I said, what? He said, yeah, not only that, in the middle of the night, he'll start talking stuff and saying things. And I said, really? Oh, yeah. He said, he said I think there's demons in the house. I said, well, I don't know. I said, if you want me to, we'll come over and pray. He said, please do that. So we made, I took a brother with me. We went over there, and sure enough, we got on that property. If you ever been around demonics, around that sort of thing, I don't know how I got off on all this, but I am there. And, and I started, and you could sense the presence of the enemy there, the, the demons. But I don't know what in this world had been going on. They had statues in every single window of that house, these little idolatrous statues. I said, well, the first thing he's got to go is all those statues. Oh, no! My grandma, my mama from Louisiana give them to me. I said, really? And I said, well, what's that one for? Oh, that was to do this, and what about that one? She had every single one of them has something, a chore or a responsibility that they both take care of. I said, well, I don't care what Mamma said. I'm telling you right now, those things are demons and devils. We need to clean the house up. If you want us to pray over the house, that's the first thing got to go. Amen. You got a burning barrel around back. Good place for them. Let's Amen. take them all around back and dump them in the burning barrel. Amen. No, she just didn't know about that. I said, well, that's what we got to do. And we, we prayed and prayed, and I'll never forget. Finally, it got so bad, they left that house and moved out. And moved to Louisiana. Matter of fact, he asked me, he said, he said, well, we got three or four vehicles, and I, I got, he had a big truck, and we still had our CDL. I said, if you drive that big truck, and, 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 and uh, we'll all go out there and move. And so that's, anyway, he went out there, and he, he died. He's, all, he's done gone on eternity now. I don't know where she's at. Hopefully, she's still not praying with them statues around. What did he do, the parrot? Now, that's something, the parrot, yeah, they finally give the parrot away. I don't know what our unfortunate household received the parrot. That's what I've done. They did. Yeah. I think first thing I've done to the parrot was after you cast the demons out of it. That's terrible. I'm just sharing with you what I know while we're there. Yeah. So we have, we do have a spiritual warfare. Now Elijah there in that 18th chapter, there was 450 Baal worshippers. And if you do any study on that Baal, I mean this guy was... Uh, a Greek, like a, a Greek, Greek mythological, uh, mythological, I'll get it out of my mouth here in a minute. You got to understand, in the morning I get up and I talk to Haiti in French and Creole, and then I have to change gears, and sometimes it's not easy sometimes. I get stuck between, somewhere between high and low gear or something like that. <laughs> Those that are here all the time know every once in a while there'll be a word come out of my mouth that's not English. It's not purpose, it's not intentional. And well, anyhow, praise the Lord. He, he's, he's there, and he's contending with these 450 prophets of Baal. This guy's got wings. I mean, he's just a, something that some devil, devil possessed somebody conjured up in their head, I guess. And there, four, can you imagine that? That many people, it was the predominant religion there was this Baal worship. And then they had the other 400 prophets of the groves. I mean, there was all kinds of everything. They had temple prostitutes, male and female. They had idols. Must have been like them fellows had them little statues carrying around in their pockets. If they had all these little statues and praying to these statues, as it were. I have to wonder, now I know they didn't have the Bible back in that time, but I, I would have to imagine if they did, they probably had a whole lot of Bibles besides the King James. Well, praise God. Are we living in such a different time? I was just reading. I was just reading recently. 
I know some groups that have completely adopted the NIV. I, 1 John 5, 7. Now think about this. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, there are three that bear, that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The NIV don't even have it, period. It's not even there. Does that tell you something? It's not even there. <clears throat> now, I imagine if we lived back in that day and you've had enough of bow worship, so we're going to go by and visit these other, see what other, these other churches, wonder what they got to offer. Well, somebody's out front, well, we got the NIV. Well, no way, over here we got the new revised version. Oh, wait a minute. Then over here we have good news for modern man. Well, that's another one. Then the newest one out. Hey, we got a brand new one over here. It's fresh off the press. It's called the Queen James. There really is a Queen James. Google it and look it up. It's got a rainbow right across the front cover. The Queen. I wonder who that what outfit that one's for. I think that's for the ones, you know, where the guys have dresses and lipstick. <laughs> And the, men, and the women are wearing combat boots and chains hanging from their... Well, praise God anyway. I personally have eyewitnessed some of this myself. I know I've shared this in the past. And I'm not going to go into any depth detail, but I was invited one time as chaplain in dive ops and one of the captains on board ship up in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, a place called Provincetown. Nobody, nobody warned us about that place. I don't have a clue. I thought it was just a normal place like any other American city, but it's not. It's not. And uh, so we've seen a lot of things. I thought we've seen a lot in the Army. I don't know. That was, that was nothing compared to this stuff. And, I mean, it just it was, it was really bad. And they had signs up. They had little substations downtown had signs up said, we are gay police and proud of it. We're gay farm. It just went on and on. It had all that up there going on. I remember telling Barry Clifford lived there and we was up there actually performing a wedding and then sort of an onboard ship. Well, I promise you I stayed on the boat all the time. I didn't need to go on land <laughs> up until I left and flew back to God's country and got back south here where they have a little bit of common sense. Yeah. Well, praise God. Yeah. <laughs> so I said that if God in heaven decides to meet judgment out on planet Earth, I can't help but believe this will be the first place to go up and smoke right here. Of course, they all thought that was funny. Well, hallelujah. That's the day we live. We're living in some terrible time right now. And I can't help but believe that God's man right here, the prophet, preacher Elijah, was dealing with probably some of the same nonsense. Studying biblical archaeology. We came across some of the, back during the Roman Empire. Some of those senators, you know, they had a republic at some time during the Roman Empire. Sometimes it was a republic. Sometimes it was an emperor. But during the time there was a republic, that, so you had a group of these senators standing around with their skirts and their red, I don't know what they used for lipstick back in those days, but they, was, they weren't natural, I can tell you that much. Paintings of these guys. So you see, it's the same spirit has been around for a long time. It's nothing new. The only, the only problem we have nowadays is, is with the aid of technology, it's just a lot more graphic and a lot more frequent. Back then they either had to carve it, paint it, or something like that. But nowadays, you just get on your little computer you carry around in your pocketbook or in your pocket, and you just bring it right on up and look at it. It's the last day we live in. We can, I know there's a lot of tools out there. I thank God that we have some maps. I can talk to Haiti back and forth all the time. And it don't cost me anything. They can send me pictures of the uh, feeding programs and the, the crusades and things that, that we're doing there in the ministry. I praise God for that. But you can also use it for evil, too. And I can't imagine parents, little children just with these in their pot. Are you kidding me? I can't, Brother Tom, can you imagine when we were old, when we were teenagers, we'd have something like that? They'd probably had, had a dozen preachers cast all the devils out of us the time we ever figured it out. I'm just being honest. Well, praise God. Everybody looking so innocent. You're not innocent about that. If you'd had a smartphone back there when you was 14, 15 years old and just starting to learn about the birds and the bees, all that, you'd have been looking at stuff you shouldn't have been looking at. Well, praise God. But you see that now walking down the street. So. Well, you just imagine 
Elijah to deal with all this stuff. Just, you know, it's one thing to worship the moon or the sun and all that, but a lot of those would worship things of a sensual nature. Why? What's well, so like James said? Don't let any man say when he is tempted, he's tempted of God. He's enticed of his own lust. And lust, when it's conceived, the Bible says, bringing forth sin. Amen. Sin, when it's finished, bringing forth death. Amen. But those of us that are blood washed, born again of the Spirit of God, the Lord gives us all power over the enemy. A L L, power over the enemy. We can overcome all these things. And when the devil comes, we don't entertain what the devil would whisper in our ears. Why? Because we know better. We've learned we're, we're ambassadors for Christ. We're soldiers of the cross, and we know better. Now listen to this about those, those false prophets. It says here in the later part of that 19th verse, about 450, the prophets of the grove, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. These false prophets, these false preachers, these no hell are, they eaten at Jezebel's table. What does that tell us? It's the same way today. It, it, people out there that are teaching damnable heresies and false doctrine and all that, they're eating at Jezebel's table. World don't got no problem with them. I've been used to, we heard about this a lot, and I haven't heard it in a long time. But they talk about the economical movement. The economical movement, in other words, all the churches all come together as one. Many ways to heaven, they say. That's, where's chapter and the verse for that one? I don't see it nowhere. I see where Jesus is the only way. Amen. He's the only way. There is no other way. John 14 and 6. There is no other way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We are Jesus only, aren't we? Amen. There is no other way. It's That's through right. him. Amen. You'd have it. But these other ones, see, they're eating at Jezebel's table. <laughs> They'll not have a problem. Why? Because they're no threat. What's going to happen if they ever start enforcing laws and come down and say, yeah, well, you're going to have to quit preaching against this and that and the other thing because it's offensive. And I read in the book where Jesus was a very rock of offense. So if we're preaching Jesus and we're preaching the gospel message, you're going to offend somebody. Amen. Somebody ain't going to like it. You're going to offend them. It might offend them enough to get them stirred up enough that they, they might want to get saved and right with the Lord. Amen. Well, he came to a confrontation with him, didn't he? He got all the people together in that 21st verse. And he said, Elijah came up, all, all the people, came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? I can't help but believe there are, there are some that, that they know the right way, and they've also been around the wrong way. And they're just, they're just undecided. But the, now, wait a minute. Do I want to go over there where... They're preaching the Bible, and sometimes the preacher gets under my hive a little bit, and sometimes I leave them a little bit upset. Of course, they wouldn't have had to left upset. They could have prayed about it, yeah. but they left upset, you see. And, and, uh, but, but I could go over here where they got black flash and strobe lights are flashing, and you know, and they got go-go dancers up there. Well, wait a minute. They don't call them that. They call them praise team, is it? Now, I'm just being honest. I... I I was invited to a church as a, for a missionary service. I was supposed to go in there and tell them about Haiti and try to get them excited and encouraged, you know, uh, about the mission work and all that. And so I, I had no clue what I was getting into. When I went in there, there was a bunch of girls. They was up front, and they was very Catholic. They didn't have much on at all, it seemed like. Didn't look to me like any different than the Dallas cheerleaders or somebody. <laughs> but they were doing it for Jesus, they said. Then they had all this loud, psychedelic music. I, I think somebody was trying to pass legislation that was referred to as noise pollution. Yeah. Well, praise God, I had somebody come to me and they was playing, that's when rap first came out. Well, this is Christian rap. <laughs> really? Sounds to me like the old vulgar stuff to me. I'm pretty sure it's probably of the same spirit. Now, is that being radical or what? Is there not a line of demarcation between God's people and that of the world? Yes, there is. We're not even 
sit at Jezebel's table. We need to feast from the table of the Lord. Amen. James said, how are you going to sit at the table with devils and the table with the Lord at the same time? You can't do it. And the prophet preacher here said, how, how haunt you between two opinions? You're going to go with the Lord, you're going to go with Baal. You're going to sit at Jezebel's table or you're going to sit at the Lord's table? That's a decision we all have to make, isn't it? Well, praise God. How long haunt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, now I don't know about you, but anybody's been serving the Lord for any measure of time at all, I know the Lord's had to do some good things for you, some wonderful things for you. I can stand, I can stand here this morning, and I can start reminiscing on some of the things the Lord has done, and I'm sure half of it I don't even probably even know about. Probably don't. Probably not even aware of it. Maybe when we get to heaven, the Lord will say, "Well, look what." Maybe I can look back and say, "Man, that was a close call right there. I didn't know that was going on. I didn't know those fellows waiting around that corner with machetes going to hack. I didn't know about all that." Well, I'm not saying that happened. I'm just making a point. There might be a whole lot of things that we weren't aware of. Right. Now I knew about one thing. We was on a plane coming back from Jamaica. We've been in Jamaica preaching and. We just come back from Jamaica. We got in a pretty bad storm, and that plane was just kind of, it just didn't, you know, it just kind of made you a little concerned. You might want to pray a little bit. <laughs> I had some team, I had a team with me, and they sitting in the back, and I sitting up there, you know, they don't let you sit just where you want to. They assign you a seat, you know, so I'm up there, and I'm minding my own business, I'm sitting there, and, and I don't know if I have my old MP3 player with the Bible or reading, I don't recall now, but it's been several years back, but one of my team members thought it was kind of funny. He walked up there and said, oh, we heard you was a preacher. I said, well, only when the Lord helped me preach. They said, well, he said, what do you think about this plane? You, we might go down. I said, boy, they she got some death stares. <laughs> People looking at him. He thought it was hilarious. He said, well, you got anything to say to all these people here? I said, you know, just in case we don't make it. What it was, we was up there flying around in circles because we was trying to land. I think it was in Atlanta. I think is what we had to check in at. And anyhow, we had to fly around for a little while up there and, and that turbulence and all that. And, and, uh, of course, those guys knew what they were doing, I reckon. But, anyway, they thought it was kind of funny. And I, I, they could have tossed him off the plane. They might have done that. I don't know. But he got some pretty bad deaths here. And I said, well, we'll pray about it. If somebody's not right with the Lord, now's a good time to get right. Yeah. Well, praise God. We had a guy tell me this one time in the Haiti. And he accused us of planning all this, but we really, we are totally innocent. Uh, I had a young man from Baptist Church up in Dothan, Alabama, and uh, another friend of mine told him what a wonderful, great cruise it was out down on that boat with us. He thought he was going on a Caribbean cruise, what he thought. <laughs> he didn't have a clue. <laughs> First thing that happened, we're down off of uh, Marco Island, and we run into a white squall. Anybody know what a white squall is? We run into a white squall. I didn't even know it. That was the first time we'd run through a white squall. I was, that was an edu educational moment, I can tell you. All I know is I seen a line of, of dark clouds. Just, it looked like a wall that was coming toward us. It was crossing that southern peninsula of Florida. I said, I don't know what this is, but it don't look good. We're going to get ready for this one. I took all my sails down. I fired the engine up on the sailboat. And I had a course headed for the uh, mile marker one going into Marco Island. I figured it might be a good place to maybe get off the ocean if we could. And uh, at least open sea. So we're headed in, and my buddy, y'all, he's up there laying in the sun, getting a suntan, I guess. Well, he just thought it was fun. Uh, the only thing he liked was a pina colada. <laughs> he was having a good time. And uh, so I'm, meanwhile, I'm running around the boat, and I'm putting extra lines on stuff and tying stuff down. I got my sails down, and we're motoring. I got the autopilot on, so it's steering the boat. And finally, that thing was getting closer, and I said, uh, I said, Dwayne, you might want to come on inside, inside the cockpit. Oh, okay. About that time that thing hit, ooh, it was, I mean, it was, they call it a white squall. We only had about two foot seas, probably. It was just a beautiful day of sailing up until that thing came along. And it was blowing the, it was, the wind was so strong, it was blowing the crest off the waves. So it was like a wall of water just coming right at us. You couldn't see nothing. Visibility, zero. I got on my VHF, the, the Coast Guard Seahawks were all flying out. And they were going out after fishermen that got stuck out there. I, I don't know what happened to all of them, but hopefully they made it through all right. But I'll never forget that. 
Dwayne's there thinking, uh, he said, well, Captain, he said, I guess you've been through this a few times. <laughs> I didn't even answer. I'm like those people was in our, that here when Elisha told them how hot you between two opinions. The Bible said they didn't even say a word. I didn't either. I sat there. I didn't say a word. I had, I had cranked that engine up almost full power, RPM. I was going backwards. <laughs> that wind was blowing us backwards. Finally, after about 15 minutes of it, I got a hold of somebody on shore. They said, Captain, you got about another 15 minutes of it, and it'll be, it'll be passed. And sure enough, that was about right. About another 15. We was about 20. So by, basically, a white squall is about a 20 to 30 minute hurricane condition is what it is. 60, 70 mile an hour winds right at us. And I, I first I thought about anchoring. We was in about probably 30 foot seas at the time. Uh, but I thought, no, we're just going to point the bow right into it and we're going to motor on in. But we were literally, I was looking on my chart plotter, we were actually going backwards instead of forward, almost full throttle. Wow. So we got into Marco Island and took a break for a little bit, for about three days, and then we continued our journey. Well, then we headed out of Boot Key Harbor in the Florida Keys. Now we're headed for Haiti. Seven water spouts we counted heading out of that channel. Seven water spouts. I've never seen seven water spouts at one time. I was actually talking to Brother Wayne Allen on the phone when one of them was coming right at us. I said, Brother Wayne, I gotta go. I gotta maneuver the boat. I'll never forget that. Water spouts coming right at us. And uh, it didn't, but it, it was headed our way. Well, should we turn around and go back? And I said, I don't think so. It looks to me like we're headed into our harbor. I think we just need to keep going the way we're going. Well, then we got down through the uh, we was in the Old Bahama Channel off the north coast of Cuba, and we got some really foul weather there. And I told Brother Dwayne, I'd been at the helm for a long time, and I was just, I was just really exhausted. So finally, about three o'clock in the morning, two o'clock, something like that, and I said, "Look, all you gotta do is keep an eye on everything. We're on autopilot. If the wind changes a little bit, I'll probably hear it. I'll probably hear the sail off a little bit, and I'll know to rearrange my, reset my sails. You know, I said, but otherwise." If you see any of these big cargo ships, them lights, if you see a red and green light, wake me up immediately. <laughs> Anybody that knows about navigation knows if you see a red and a green light, that means he's coming straight at you. <laughs> Depend okay, so anyway. So about three or four o'clock in the morning, man, I'm I'm just really in a deep sleep. Keep shaking me, shaking me. I, I think I think I think we got a problem. I look up and all I see was red and green lights coming right at us. And I said, Yeah, we we have definitely got a problem here. I'm doing my best to get the engine started, and I couldn't get it started quick enough. Full throttle, hard starboard. <laughs> he didn't miss us by much. He'd, have, he'd arrived in port with probably a mass and what was left of that sailboat hanging on the side of his cargo ship. Those guys from the island, some of them don't speak English, number one. Number two, they, get, they drink their baba cool rum and play dominoes. They ain't nobody in the car. They didn't go even see what's out there. It's on cruise control, man. They just... 12 knots, man, right down through there. <laughs> well, that was a close call. No, I said, Dwayne, you're supposed to be watching. The chart, the, the autopilot don't have eyes. It don't have ears. It just goes where you tell it to go. I don't know why I'm sharing all this, but that's a reason for it. I'm just sharing with you. <laughs> well, then to beat all that, we got down into the Windward Passage about 3 o'clock. It always happens 3 o'clock in the morning. I don't know why that is. It seems like it. About three o'clock in the morning, this electrical storm comes through. I mean, they were lightning bolts hitting all around that boat. I mean, they were hitting the water, clapping loud. I mean, just almost deafening you. And lightning bolts hitting all around that. And I was at a stainless steel helm. Yeah. Stainless steel helm. Yeah. I had to take it off the autopilot because we had too much wind. That thing hit us. We had some powerful wind, and yeah. so I had to be at the helm to steer the boat. Yeah. Well, I couldn't leave. And my crew didn't have a clue what he was doing, so I couldn't leave him at the helm. You don't want to get broadside and something like that. My sails were up, by the way. So it was even more crucial that I stay into the wind and hope I don't get a blown out sail because, you know, like that, they call it luffy. Violent winds. I didn't have time to go out there and get them down. It just happened that quick. Well, we got through that mess. It almost sounded like I'm making this all up, but God in heaven knows I was there. I'm not making any of this up. We come around the south coast of Haiti now. We make it through that ordeal. We get around the south coast of Haiti, and the seas picked up. Ah, 10, 12 foot seas. It's not comfortable. My sailing mentor, who taught me to sail about 25, 30 years ago, maybe 30 years, it's been a long time. 
I, I made quite a few voyages with him. I, that's the Canadians taught us to sail way back there. We was running power boats, but we found out wind was free, so we went from power to sail. And so anyhow, we were sailing, and we was having to tack. You can't sail directly into the wind. You have to zigzag to catch the wind from an angle. So we call that tacking. Well, we were tacking, and my sailing mentor was a day behind us. Uh, he started behind us. I didn't know all this till later on. Meanwhile, there was a Haitian merchant boat, no engine or anything, just pure sailing, and he was zigzagging. I passed him, and I noticed long about evening he disappeared. I didn't see him no more. Of course, they don't have no lights or nothing, just maybe a charcoal grill on the deck where they're cooking their rice and beans or something. Yeah. That's about it. They don't have any kind of nav lights or nothing. But I noticed I never seen him no more. Make a long story short, we made it through that mess. Made it all the way into La Vache. Got in there, and I come to find out that my sailing mentor that taught us to sail many years ago, he got demasked in the very same seas and the same weather. Got de in other words, his mast broke on the boat. Wow. And he had to cut everything loose and let it sink to the bottom. And then he didn't have enough fuel to get him on in, so he had to make a port there off the south coast. And he got a hold of us to bring, send somebody to carry diesel fuel out to him in little dugout canoes. That was quite a chore. So we had, and then the merchant boat has sank. We found out it sank. They lost that vessel. Nobody was hurt, but they lost everything aboard. So when we got to Ilavash, Dwayne, this is what he said. This, this is why I told you all this story. He said, I don't know how you did it. He said, but now I know. You're taking people like me that are lukewarm, that don't come to church half the time. He said, he said, I have never been so close to Jesus in my whole walk. He said, I have been praying and repenting. He said, I don't know how you did it, but, but that's, that's exactly what you're doing, isn't it? And he jumped off the boat and went to shore, and I didn't even see him for a week. <laughs> didn't even see him for a week. He thought somehow I'd planned all that. I promise you, one or two little storms might have been all right, but all that, no. In all the years we've been sailing back and forth in the mountains, we have never, ever, ever had all that happen in one single trip. It did that one. White squall, electrical storm, heavy seas, uh, people, a sank, boat sinking, being demasked. Oh, and my me sailing mentor finally come crippling in with no mass. He comes in, he just shook his head, said, I don't even know what to say. He said, all I got to say is God must be with you. <laughs> That's what he said. I said, well, the Lord does look over us, doesn't he? Right. Yeah. Well, God looked over Elijah here in our scriptural reading this morning, 18th chapter of 1 Kings. We know about the story. He came into the confrontation with all those false preachers, false prophets. Now, see, that's the thing about false prophets and people that's doing it with a falsehood and the devil. The devil has a certain amount of power, but Jesus is all power. Amen. Amen. See, he has a certain... I mean, they, they, they use trickery. In the country of Haiti, we have witch doctors that can take a head of a chicken, bite it off, chicken flopping around, yeah. stick it back in his mouth again, pull it back out intact. It's trickery. Demonic trickery. Yeah. Walking across hot coal fire. Yeah. Try that without... Yeah, you know, it's a spirit all right, but it ain't the Holy Spirit. Amen. See, that's the problem. People get, if they're not careful, there's familiar spirits, false spirits. See, and... Well, we're in a spiritual warfare, aren't we? Yes, but we have all power over the enemy. And I've said this and I'll say it again. I'm not looking for demons and I'm not looking for devil. You don't got to look for him, I promise you. He knows where you're at. He'll come looking for you. But on the other hand, we live in right for the Lord. We do have all power over the enemy. Amen. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Elijah faced 850 of these yahoos. Imagine that. He even mocked him at one point, we read there in 18th chapter. Mm -hmm. They got so carried away in, in that false spirit, they was cutting themselves all up. Well, where, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe he's taking a nap over there someplace. <laughs> I know I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Yeah. And then when he went to prove the Lord, not only did the Lord come and take the... I mean, they doused it with water, dug a trench around it. Imagine that, and the Lord consumed it all up. When it comes to a showdown... He said, choose you this day. Almighty. Choose this day. You're going to walk after some quackery, some half-baked, lukewarm nonsense, or are you going to be where you can feel the presence of God and pray and know Him Amen. in, in, in His Word? <clears throat> you see? Right. 
There's just a lot out there to try to sidetrack us. We're living, we got to be right in the end time prophetically. I don't know about you, but I won't be like those wise virgins. I don't want to be like the foolish ones. I want my lap full of oil. If that preacher trims my wick once or twice, that's fine. Keep right on. I want that light to shine. A lot of folks got oil in their lamp, but their wicks got dirty. I know about that because when my wife and I and my family lived in the mountains of Haiti, we had no electricity. We burnt coal kerosene lamps. I can tell you a minute not sitting there trying to read my Bible or what have you. If that wick gets a little bit dirty, it starts putting off black smoke. So it gets sudden. Then you, you look up in the rafters and up around that, and you're going to see where it's making everything all suck. That's about how it is with some people in the church. They, get, they, don't, they don't trim their wicks, and they come in, and they just, they just leave an after effect. Well, praise God. Yeah. Well, I thought, I thought the Lord give us that message this morning. I might have hit there, here, there, and the other place, but and Elijah said, Why well, halt you between two opinions? <laughs> if the Lord be God... Most of us know the Lord is God. We know that. Most of us have been reared up in a, in a Bible school, in a, in a um, Bible school, Sunday school. We know. We've learned John 3, 16 almost from the cradle. If the Lord be God. These folks knew too. They knew the power of God. They've seen God work miracles. But yet they allowed all this idolatry false prophets and all this to come in on them till just about consumed them and got to the place they had to have a showdown. And Elijah talked to them. Why well, halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If thou, then follow him. I felt that was this morning. If the Lord be God, follow him. Amen. And follow him. Follow him. <laughs> Thou be God, then go follow Him. If you think all your hope is in marijuana, cigarettes, and alcohol, and whatever other nonsense the devil's got out there, then, then follow Thou. But if the Lord be God, follow Him. We know what the end of both roads, don't we? If the Lord be God, we follow Him. They might even come and destroy this body, but we're going to go be with Jesus and the saints. And, but if you go by the way the world is going to happen, it'll be the second death. Oh, Tom, won't you come and lead us in a song here as we come to a close? Piano player. I'm not trying to de-Christianize anybody, but if somebody have a need, this is a good place to take care of it right here. Amen. Amen. The Lord's trying to help us around here. <laughs> Amen. Would you stand in 167? Physical, spiritual. 167. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Oh, dear Jesus. Just a little 